That's why we need the professional here. Yes. <laughs> well, in the first line, you're profoundly human faith. Yes, we are very human. <laughs> okay. We are profoundly, profoundly human, human faith. faith. Whether, Whether we see our charge as loving our neighbor or, or ending the suffering of all sentient beings. Whether a transcendent dimension is part of our worldview or not, our primary focus for religious action is the well-being of this world. We wrestle with our ideas about human limitation and human power and acknowledge that our understandings are imperfect. Now we say the child's lighting statement. The flaming chalice is an interior lamp, a flame to light indoors in the particular context of worship. As an emblem, it's a symbol of our religion as practiced in sanctuaries and homes. But it has a cousin in our symbolic tradition that is a flame lit in the public square, the beacon lit in times of public crisis, the candles held up in the vigils. The lantern is a steeple. Please be seated. Please come forward. Do you have any uh, stories or concerns you'd like to share? For community at large, for those that protect and serve here and overseas, those who can't be with us here today. And we'll light one for Chris, because you want me to light one for the Browns as well. There's every team that needs prayers. Um, and a candle of joy, and mom doesn't know this yet, but my cousin Ian surprised everybody and mailed out and said they're now a parent. So I now have a new first cousin once removed. Thomas Cameron Cranston was five pounds seven ounces, born October sixth. Eighteen inches. Eighteen of pure inches masculinity. long. Pure masculinity. Oh, <laughs> so, it was one of those we never even knew she was pregnant. Just kind of sent an email, said, "I'm not putting it on Facebook." By the way, here's your new cousin. So I was like, "Oh." Well. And I, it was a new phone number, so I didn't even know who it was from. I was like, "Well, who is this? Who sent me this?" Friday, 
we go to get the staples removed. So prayer is what he has a fit and, and refuses to let them do it that we get it done. And then he continues to do well at the nursing home at the rehab center. Everybody there knows what he, he he visits everybody, talks to everybody, everybody knows who he is. So. Let's be in prayer. O oh, great spirit of the Indian people, hear my words, for they are words that come from the heart, soul, and mind. O oh, great spirit, be my mind, be my eyes, be my ears, be my heart, be my soul, so that I may walk with dignity and pride. O oh, great spirit of the Indian people, know of me, for I am of your people. I am Indian, an Indian of the circle of light, a prisoner of war in my own land. O oh, great spirit of the Indian people, hear my words, for they are for you, they are of you. You are my way of life in the circle of life. Yesterday morning, I sat in my home here on the Navajo Reservation and watched a live webcast at the Evangelical Immigration Table. I felt impotent, tired, angry, and frustrated, for on my screen, Christians were rallied around and celebrating the introduction of a bipartisan immigration reform bill that was to be introduced by the Gang of Eight Senators. I felt this way because nearly a decade I, decade I have been talking, writing, speaking, and praying about the importance of intentionally including the voices of indigenous people in the process to comprehensively and justly reform immigration law. I have walked the halls of Congress and hand delivered letters to senators and representatives. I have spoken on the boards of churches and Christian organizations. I have built relationships with national Christian, academic, and political leaders. I have written blogs, published articles, spoken at conferences, and presented seminars, all asking, imploring, our nation to intentionally reach out to and include the voices of Native people in the dialogue on immigration reform. But to no avail, based on Wednesday, April 17, 2013, without ever even consulting members of the Native community, the Gang of Eight introduced their plan to comprehensively reform our nation's immigration laws. As I watched on a live webcast as my non-Native friends, my partner organizations, the leaders of the church, even our politicians celebrated this milestone and congratulated themselves. And this is not the first time I have felt this way. Numerous times in the last 15 months as I worked tirelessly to draw attention to the U.S. apology to Native people that was buried in the 2010 Department of Defense Appropriations Bill. I would feel these emotions. It was the same drill as with immigration reform. I spoke, wrote, published blog, walked the halls of Congress, spoke with national leaders, attended conferences, led seminars, doing everything I could to invite our nation, our leaders, and our church to own their apology. But almost everyone I spoke to couldn't be bothered enough to take action. 
I don't understand it. Am I mute? Can I not be seen? Is my writing ineligible? How can so many people listen to my words and express appreciation for them to my face, for them, when they are brought by God to an audience with power, or presented by Him with an opportunity for action, forget these words and remember their appreciation no longer? I don't know what to do next. I have prayed, I have spoken, I have written, I have reached out, I am tired. I guess my only alternative is to go back to the drawing board and once again get down on my knees. So if you read this and agree with these words, I ask you to pray with me this prayer that I modeled after Moses' prayer for the Israelites when he was with God on top of Mount Sinai. Father, over 500 years ago, a sailor got lost at sea. And in your name, he claimed to have discovered a land that was already inhabited. It was followed by hundreds and thousands and soon millions of other undocumented undocumented immigrants. In your name, these immigrants committed acts of genocide against our native peoples. In your name, they stole our land. In your name, they signed and then broke treaties. In your name, they took our children from our homes and violently forced them to assimilate to their culture. In your name, they counted on us as less than human. And in your name, they marginalized those of us who were left to the fringes of their society. Father, a little over three years ago, in your name, the ancestors of these immigrants attempted to apologize for their history. But in your name, they vaguely wounded their apology so that they could not be held accountable for their actions. And in your name, they buried their apology in the Defense Department Appropriations Bill and never spoke of it publicly. And Father, today, in your name, they are rallying around and celebrating a proposed bill to comprehensively reform immigration reform. But they have not ever, never acknowledged nor reconciled the original immigration injustice of this nation nor have they seriously consulted or included the voices of the indigenous people of this land in the writing of this bill. For as native peoples, we are all but invisible to them. So, Father, for nothing other than the glory of your name, I ask you to act. For the glory of your name, I ask you to compel this nation of immigrants to acknowledge and face their unjust history. For the glory of your name, I ask you to bring a conversation for reconciliation to the forefront of our national consciousness. For the glory of your name, I ask you to demonstrate to my country that without being reconciled with and getting input from indigenous people, this nation of immigrants lacks the authority to comprehensively reform immigration law, as well as the ability to rule these lands justly. For the glory of your name, I ask you to raise up indigenous peoples that allow us to once again be the host of this land, to share our families, our stories, and our connection to this land with our guests. Father, if you fail to act, if you allow the United States and your church to play both sides of this coin, if you allow them to commit acts of injustice in your name, if you allow them to bury their apology for these injustices in your name, if you allow them to celebrate their blindness and rule without integrity in your name, then many native peoples in the United States and other indigenous peoples throughout the world may see your inaction and conclude as true the lie which we have been told for five centuries, that you are truly the white man's God. Father, I'm not asking you to judge our nation, nor am I asking your vengeance upon our guests. Instead, I am pleading for your healing. Heal my people, heal our guests, heal our land. As I walk, as I walk, the universe is walking with me. In beauty it walks before me, in beauty it walks behind me. In beauty it walks below me, in beauty it walks above me. Beauty is on every side. As I walk, I walk with beauty. May we now have the offering.
celebrate the web of life.
Columbus in the Bay of Pigs. How wonderful Columbus has been in discovering America. Let me tell you how it is from the uh, Taino language. And that's T-A-I-N-O. Imagine the sand at the beach called Milan, fine and white, the big pin that turns the corner of the Bay of Pigs, Cuba. Touch it. Take some of your fingertips, let it fall. You're touching the blood of an empire. A cloudless midday, May 26, 1492, two years after his voyage of discovery, the Italian Cristoforo Colombo, Christopher Columbus, called by the Spaniards Cristobal Colón, approaches the mouth of the Bay of Pigs. He is in his second voyage to the Indies. He thinks he is off the coast of China and carries letters of state from the king and queen of Spain to the great emperor Khan. He stands on the quarter deck, squinting at the shore, wondering if Cuba is finally the mainland that he seeks. The land is a searing disc directly above his head. His troubled thoughts turn back to Isabella, his colony on Haiti, with half his men sick, the rest angry and bitter, little gold collected, food supplies low, the Indians strained and weary. Yesterday's shore has been lined with Indian villages. The ships are often surrounded by Teano Arawaks and canoes, offering songs and gifts to their visitors from the sky, not yet understanding what it meant to be subjects of a European king. But today, at the mouth of pigs, Columbus sees no village, the shores mangrove swamp, impenetrable. Suddenly glistening before them, a white crescent of sand laced with palm groves. Churning water, a great herd of beasts, the Indians called them manatee, but the seamen called them pigs. The boats were lowered, the rowers pulled their oars, the hulls fly through the waves up onto the beach. Columbus steps out, his foot sinks softly into the sand, a play of her own. From his logbook, these are his very words. At the edge of the sea, in a great grove of palms, there seemed to reach to the sky. There gushed forth two springs of water, and when the tide was on the ebb, the water was so cold and so sweet that no better could be found in the world. No people appeared, but there were signs of their presence in cut palms. And we should all rested there on the grass by those springs among the scent of the flowers, and the sweet singing of little birds, and all was so gentle, and the shade of the palms so grand and fair. To see it all was a wonder. So Columbus gushed all over as he found the Bay of Pigs, he, and he, as he did over so much of the New World. But beneath his enthusiasm was a dark side of Columbus, an underside. Near by the Bay of Pigs and Laguna de Terrasro, Lake of the Treasure, where the local Tainos threw their sacred objects of gold to hide them from the Spaniards. Somewhere on the bottom today, lay there. they still lay there. He had undertaken his enterprise in the spirit of science, but lusted for gold and power, and sailed into the setting sun, not just to discover the Indies, but to conquer them. That's the deal he wrangled from the king and queen of Spain three years before, that he, through a commander, a foreigner, would become governor and viceroy of all islands and continents that he might discover and acquire, as well as admiral of the ocean sea, and be granted the noble title of Don. And he would get to keep one-tenth of all gold, sil silver, pearls, gems, spices, and other merchandise of these lands, free of all taxes. But none of this Columbus was doing for himself alone. No, he saw visions and portents and, and greater plans. He had sworn to the Virgin Mary that if he, she would guide him by this new route, by passing the Muslim block blockade of the road to the east, he would repay her within seven years by converting the Indies to the Christian faith and by gathering its fabled wealth to pay for a new crusade to reconquer the Holy Land from the infidels. And by the fall of Jerusalem and the recapture of the Holy Scepter of Jesus by his troops, scheduled to occur about the dawn of the year 1500, Columbus was certain would be the signal for the second coming. And when the Virgin Mary did, or so he thought, guide Columbus across the water at the very first land he touched, he began to repay her by kidnapping six Canos. They had interrogated us as if we had come from heaven, he wrote, and cried out in loud voices to the others, Come see the men from the sky, bring them food and drink. There came many of both sexes, everyone bringing something, giving thanks to God, prostrating themselves on the earth, lifting up their hands to heaven. I took by force six of the Indians from the first island, and intend to carry them to Spain, in order to learn our language and return, unless your highness should choose instead to have them transported to Spain, or held captive on the island. These people are very simple in matters of war. I could conquer the whole of them with 50 men and govern them as I please. They are all of good size and stature, straight limbed with ex out exception and handsomely formed, with fine shapes and faces, their hair short, coarse, like a horse's tail, combed toward the forehead except for a small portion which they let hang down behind and never cut. 
Their eyes are very large and beautiful. They quickly learn such words as are spoken to them. They are very clever and honest, display great liberality, and will give whatever they possess for a trifle or for nothing at all. Whether there exists any such thing as private property among them, I have not been able to ascertain. As they appear to have no religion, I believe they would very readily become Christians. They would make good servants. They are fit to be ordered about and made to work to sow and do aught else that, they may, that we may need. And your majesty may build towns and teach them to go closed and adopt our customs. Seeing some with little bits of gold at their noses, I gathered by signs that by going southward, there would be found a king with large vessels of gold in large quantities. To sum up the great progress of this voyage, I am able to promise for a trifling assistance from your majesty, any quantity of gold, drugs, cotton, mastic, maloa, and as many slaves for a maritime service as your majesty may stand in need of. Those were the words of Christopher Columbus. Yes, Christopher Columbus invented the slave trade in the new world. Who were these Tainos? Probably the friendliest people in all the Americas. Tainos means peaceful or good. They lived in villages of round palm thatched canes, some with several thousand inhabitants. The men and boys wore no clothes, nor did the girls until their first ministration, and then a small naga, and after marriage, a woven cotton apron. They slept in net hammocks. The women wore lightning bugs in their hair. Their main weapons were cane spears with a fishbone tip. They hunted their round hog-like huta with trained little barkless dogs. They used pet parrots to decoy wild ones. They used their feet. They braved the sea and cedar dug out canoes with square ends, some large enough to carry 80 or more. They tied a rope to the tail of the remora fish, and when the remora attached itself to another fish by its sucker mouth, the fishermen would pull them both out. The tanus were great swimmers. Their bread was cassava, baked on a stone griddle. They kept the pepper pot soup simmering at all times. They shaped clay coils into pots, wove baskets from bileo leaves. They mixed earth and ashes into kanoko mounds where they grew cassava. Near rivers, they used ditch irrigation. On hillsides, they planted corn, five kernels in each hole a pace apart. They grew yams, beans, peppers, arrowroot, peanuts, kept orchards of coconuts, papayas, mammies, pears, guavas, and pineapples. They had broad, flat foreheads from being pressed between boards as infants. In their pierced ears and noses, they wore shell, bone, stone, and gold. They painted their bodies with symbols, the men preferring red, the women yellow, white, and black. They bathed daily using big old root as soap. To lock a house, they placed a stick across the entrance and no Tano would think to pass. Their only rivals were the Caribs of the Lesser Antilles, who would raid occasionally in search of women. The Tainos never raided back. Who were these Taino people? At the hub of each village was a plaza, a ceremonial center, with a temple housing the village Zemus. These were effigies of stone, wood, shell, or gold, in which resided messengers to the gods. Near the temple was a court where they played a ceremonial ball game in recreation of a heroic myth. Close by was the Bohol, the large rectangular home of the Kakakee and his or her extended family. The Kakakee's job was the village welfare, assigning the daily work routine and making sure everyone got a fair share. Two of the six main Kakakees on Haiti, when Columbus arrived, were women. The Tanus danced to songs of tribal history, of the Zimas of love and mourning. They danced revolving in circles with strings of rattling shells on their wrists and ankles, waving palm fronds to the sound of hollow log drums, shell timbers, copper, and gold cassinets. The Bohati priests sang Ariatus to cure the sick to the drone of a Mayahavan, a wooden gong with a long neck, so resonant it could be heard a half a league away. They believe, they believe there was an immortal being in the sky whom none could see, who has a mother but no beginning. They called him Yakahu and his mother Adabex. The Zimis were their messengers. They believed that out of a cave called Yoyo Baba, on the Isle of Haiti, came the sun and the moon. From two other nearby caves, Kakabahaku and Amahabu, came the Taino people. They believed that the ocean was formed from the great flood that poured out of the stolen calabash that Demi Man dropped. They believed that at death their souls journeyed to the beautiful valley of Kobe, presided over by the Kakakyu Makatari, where they remained in pleasure forever. They had a myth, an old story remembered in many areas, of how once a great Kakakyu named Guamakua, who wore clothes and a beard, came down from the sky in a ship from a place called Turi, bringing precious gifts and teaching the Tano people many skills. 
Tanakuna could only stay a short while, then left, promising to return someday. Was it a wonder then, when Columbus appeared at these shores, that the Tamils called him Kamakaku? Expected him to stay only a short while, and were shocked when they realized he didn't plan to leave at all? In the Zimi Temple was a round wooden table on which they kept powdered kava alu. The Bahati priest would place some of, of the head on a Zimi, sniff the kahaba through a branch cane, fall into a trance, speak with the Zimi, then return with a message in archaic tongue. The word kahaba meant to pray. It was through the Kahaba that the Kakakyu, Kakavai, well, spoke with the Zimi, Yaya Kabu Gama, who gave him decades prior a prophecy of the arrival of Christians and a warning of what they would do. All the Kakakis knew their prophecy but hadn't the heart to tell their people. On his first voyage, two years before he reached the Bay of Pigs, Columbus wrecked his flagship Santa Maria on a reef off Haiti, the cultural center of the Taino world. He was rescued from the reef by the local chief, Guanacari. Columbus stayed only long enough to build a fort, then sailed back to Spain on the Nino, leaving 39 men behind. Returning 10 months later, Columbus found the settlement burned to the ground. Guanacari had tried to protect the Christians, but they had abused the Taino people in Teltanabo's Golden House, Kakaki of the Golden Mountains of Coabo. <coughs> the most powerful chief on Haiti came down and killed them all. Tanabo was held in awe by the Tainos, by blood, by blood half Carib, the Taino's only tribal enemies. He had risen through sheer ability to the top of the Taino world. He shared power with his wife, Anacana, flower of gold, renowned for wisdom, graciousness, and beauty. Columbus knew he'd have to settle the score with the Kanaba someday, but first business was a new settlement. Isabella gathered gold and discovered the mainland. So Columbus left most of his men on Haiti and sailed off once more to the Bay of Pigs and beyond, until he was so certain that Cuba was the mainland that he made his entire crew sign an oath that they would never say it was an island like the stubborn Indians insisted, under penalty of having their tongues cut out. On his return to Haiti, he found the colony in disastrous straits. Little gold had been collected, far from enough to cover expenses, much less fulfill his extravagant promises. In desperation, he proposed to the kings and queen, as a temporary expedient, of course, until the gold mines began to produce, a plan to capture and sell all the Carib Indians on the fanciful grounds that they were implacable cannibals and fierce enemies of Spain's friends, the Tainos. But the king and king balked, and as the first few Indians he sent quickly died. Meanwhile, gangs of soldiers were roaming Haiti, skirting only the province of Cannibal, committing brutalities of every sort against the Tainos who suffered in silence until one chief, Gua Tagaga, ambushed three Spaniards and killed them. Columbus didn't hesitate. By Spanish law, rebels could be enslaved. Besides, Tainos was easier to catch than Caribs. He sent his army to their village, rounded up 1,500 men, women, and children, chose 550 of the fittest, boarded them on four ships, and sent them off to the slave market in Seville, Spain. The rest Columbus offered to the colonists as personal slaves, his compliments, no charge. 200 died aboard the ship, most of the rest soon after arrival. Guatacana was condemned to death by arrows, but chewed through his ropes and escaped to the mountains where he organized resistance. Columbus found him and attacked with artillery, cavalry, infantry, and dogs. In the end, Guatacana's people made Columbus another few shiploads of slaves. Yet he was only a sub sheep to the great Kakaku Hannibal, who had been approached now with more caution. Columbus sent a delegation with gifts to Conoco, led by Lieutenant O.G. Regida, already famed as the first to enforce Columbus' decree to cut off the ears or nose of any, of any Indian stealing Spanish property. In his village high in the mountains of Cabello, Oja met Canabo, who wore a crown with wings on its side like a shield and golden eyes as large as silver cups. Ojeda told him that Columbus offered peace if only he would come down to the settlement to talk. Canabo, despite everything, responded, yes, if Gamacuna wants peace, I will make peace. I will only ask one thing, be given the Christian's church bell as a sign. So they started down, stopping at a riverbank. Ojeda held up a set of manacles to Canabo and said, these are ceremonial bracelets worn only by kings on horseback. Lord Columbus has sent them for you to wear on this great occasion. So Canabo became the first Indian to ever ride one of these magic creatures called horse. Kanabo was tied to the saddle behind Ojeda, the chains locked on his wrists and ankles. Ojeda suddenly spurred the horse across the river, away from the startled Indian delegation, and hardly stopped until they reached the settlement, where the greatest chief of Haiti, 
instead of being given the church bell, was thrown at Columbus's feet, chained on the porch of Columbus's house on the main plaza for all to see. The entire island, except for the village of Kukaganguya, rose and revolt, but the Tano's fishbone tipped spears were no match for gold steel, so all the island was quickly conquered. And Columbus, imitating Caesar and Gaul, imposed tribute on the native people. Each Tano, over 14 years of age in the region of Quebec, had to pay enough gold to fill a hawk's bell measure every three months. And in return, received a brass token to wear about his neck as proof of up-to-date payments. Cacacus had to pay a half a calabash full of gold every two months. The penalty was, for non-payment was the amputation of the hands. The gold that Catanamos possessed had been collected over many generations. Within a season, Columbus had it all, and the only way the Tanos could fill their quotas was to dig it from the riverbanks. Soon the streams were filled with whole families desperately trying to find enough in time. They began to flee to the highest mountains and remotest spots, leaving their crops unplanted, and famine stalked the land. But the Christians came after them. When the Tano's caught a Spaniard now, they melted gold and poured it down his throat. Columbus kept the great Kakaku Katabu chained on his front porch for two years, kept, the, kept put on a, the rest on a ship for Spain. The Katabu died at sea. One by one, all the chiefs of Haiti, men and women, were tortured, hanged, impaled, burned at the stake, except for God of Tanya, Columbus's one unwavering friend. He was banished by his own village for Columbus had not exempted even them from the horrors of the tribute collections. So Kakagonari, an outcast, died a squalid death on some remote peak. The Tanos could not understand why the Christians wanted this gold. One Kakaki of Haiti, Hatui, fled with his people to Cuba. When told that the Christians had followed him, he took out a basket of gold and said, here is the God of the Christians. They want us to worship this God. That is why they struggle with us and kill us. Let us dance for this God. Who knows? They may please the Christian God, and then they will do us no harm. So he and his people danced before the gold, then the Haitu hurled into the middle, hurled into the middle of a river. Not long after, the Christians caught him and tied him to a stake. A friar who knew the Taino language showed hot tea just before they touched the flames. If you become a Christian even now, you will go to heaven instead of the eternal torment of hell. Hati asked the friar, do all Christians go to heaven? The friar said they do, and Hati replied, I would prefer them to go to hell. And so the island of Haiti, which is the Tano means mountain house of which nothing is greater, a land thriving with millions of people where, when Columbus arrived, within a short time, was almost depopulated. Most of the Tano men wound up as slaves in the mines, most of the women slaves in the fields, with thousands died of exhaustion, disease, and hunger. Those hiding in the mountains saw that all was lost, the thousands jumped from cliffs, hanged or stabbed themselves or drank cassava poison, and the beautiful Tano language became silence. Most of the gold, the treasure of Tano Nation, was stowed on a fleet bound for Spain. But Gamagox, the zinni of hurricanes, rose a great wind and sucked the gold to the ocean bottom to mix with the bones of Canaba. Faced with the labor shortage, the Christians sent soldiers to the other islands to capture slaves from the mines and plantations of Haiti, and they began setting up plantations and mines on those islands, too. What sort of man was this Columbus? The son of a weaver. He pretended to descend from an ancient Rome consul. And then sent him to the sailors on his first voyage. The king and queen had offered a reward to the first man to sight land, a reward of 40,000 marabies per year for life, a trifle for a rich man, a fortune for a poor. Who was this man? He had read the imaginary travels of Sir John Mandeville, taking it literally. So when he finally did reach the continent at the river of Venezuela, he made perhaps his greatest discovery. He said, I've always read that the world of land and sea is sir. Cervical. All authorities and reported experiments have confirmed this until now. But I have found such irregularities here that I have come to the conclusion the world is not round, but the shape of a pear. I believe that the earthly paradise lies here, as testified in the Holy Scripture. The Tanos were not the only ones with reason to hate the governor. A steady stream of colonists returning to Spain accused him of abuse of authority. Fiscal mismanagement, withholding of salaries, embezzlement, Boundless personal ambition. Some rose in the first colonial revolt in the New World, in, a, in alliance with the Tainos, led by Columbus's former footman and squire, when he had his wisdom, when in his wisdom he had been appointed the Chief Justice. Meanwhile, almost all the Indian slaves that Columbus sent to Spain died, until finally the king and queen decided to send the last few Indians alive in Spain back to the Indies, along with the royal investigator, who sailed to the harbor of Columbus's new capital, Santo Domingo 
The first thing he saw there, the three swaying bodies on the gallows, rebels hanged hours before. In the prison, more rebels scheduled for hanging next time. Bobadillo declared Columbus disposed and ordered him arrested. But the soldiers who confronted Columbus suddenly took fright, and none of them were willing to arrest him or put the chains on the admiral of the ocean sea. Until one man stepped forward, Epinoza, Columbus's personal cook, who took the chains and snapped them on his master's wrist. So Columbus went back to Spain to face the mercy of the crown and never fulfilled his vow to the Virgin Mary. <coughs> The struggle of the Taino people was not in vain. Today, after 500 years, the Indian nations are still resisting, although they still suffer injuries daily. The injuries they suffer injure us all. They struggle to survive, and it is for all of us. The indigenous people have never struggled only for physical survival, but for a way of living harmoniously with the planet. The Indian elders are correct when they say that the indigenous people are the caretakers of the world. The grandchildren of colonialism owe the native people an enormous debt. We are still just guests here and should be humble. Only by joining with the indigenous people in common struggle could non-native people ever hope to come at peace anywhere in this continent and build a constructive future. Small Taino communities and groups of families, primarily in eastern Cuba and Puerto Rico, miraculously survived the genocide led by Columbus. Quietly retaining their cultural integrity over the last 500 years, they are finally resurfacing today, asserting their indigenous identity and reclaiming their culture. There is a connected community of Tainos in North America. Indigenous Peoples Day reimagines Columbus Day and changes the celebration of colonialism into an opportunity to reveal historical truth about the genocide and oppression of indigenous people in the Americas, to organize against current injustice and to celebrate indigenous resistance. The idea of replacing Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day was born in 1977 at a UN-sponsored conference in Geneva, Switzerland on discrimination against indigenous populations in the Americas. Fourteen years late, later, led by activists in Berkeley, California, the city council there declared October 12th the day of solidarity with indigenous people. Henceforth, the growing movement to appropriate Columbus Day as Indigenous Peoples Day states such as South Dakota, Hawaii, and Alabama. Oklahoma City, this was written October 1st of this year, replaces Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. And not only are they doing it, but many other cities in Oklahoma are now changing Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. There are so many indigenous people that live in Oklahoma. The UU faith calls us to fully understand the legacy of Christopher Columbus, just as it calls for us to respect and learn from indigenous people and support their struggle for social justice and religious freedom. Indigenous People Days reimagines Columbus Day and changes the celebration. And the idea of replacing Columbus Day is also supported by the UU. They have ways to honor indigenous people. You can go online or take a look at this. I have, I'll let it sit up here. Um, we can, people can try to get Columbus Day renamed Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, we can hold movie screening with discussions, discussions afterwards. Um, movies like Columbus Day Legacy in American Indian issues. These could be video alone too from the Multicultural Growth and Witness Division of the UUA. We could host a congregation-wide common read and book discussion with several books in Indigenous People's History of the United States, A Little Matter of Genocide, many, many others. Uh, engage with immigration as a moral issue. Um, there's more of that for Central America. We can take action for the rights and needs of Native American people. There's an action website to do that on. There's, lot, there's many, many more resources that you can use, that you can do. And the Unitarian Universal Association has passed several um, resolutions for making this Indigenous People's Day tomorrow instead of Columbus Day. So to, to fully recognize these and our many other resolutions on the rights of Native peoples, UU staff and headquarters now recognize Indigenous Peoples Day as, as an official holiday in place of Columbus Day, as suggested by George Tinker in the chapter of his book, Soul Work. Please stand and join with me in singing this is my song, Life is Denied.
Our closing hymn is number 159. Please rise in body arms. Our closing hymn is number 159. Please rise and body arms. Our closing hymn is number 159. 